Welcome to a Legendarium special about the Telltale Heart, Edgar Allan Poe's most famous story. In the comments section, please let me know what you think about the narrator and the old man in Poe's story. From the beginning, Edgar Allan Poe did not have a happy life. His father abandoned the family early on, and his mother Eliza died soon after from tuberculosis. For the rest of his life, Poe always carried a miniature portrait of her on his person. He and his siblings went to different foster homes throughout Richmond, Virginia, and Edgar went to the home of a Scottish-born tobacco merchant named John Allen. As a youth, Edgar proved an accomplished athlete, and once swam six miles against the current of the James River, a feat which made him a local hero. As a teenager, Poe saw his foster mother, Mrs. Allen, slowly dying from tuberculosis. Meanwhile, Poe's foster father, John Allen, carried on a series of love affairs with other women in the very house where his wife slowly died. To have his affairs in peace, John Allen sent Edgar to the University of Virginia. The rough and raucous school saw widespread gambling among students, frequent visits from the police, and a student who once murdered a professor. Poe covered the walls of his dorm room with artwork and read his poems aloud to his fellow students. However, his wealthy foster father refused to cover any costs for Poe's upkeep. In time, Poe smashed his own furniture and burned it to keep warm during the harsh Virginia winters. To escape debtor's prison after a run of bad luck at the gambling tables, Poe enlisted in the U.S. Army. He trained as an explosive handler, then became a cadet at West Point. During his first semester, Poe accrued a staggering 44 offenses and 106 demerits. Legends abound about Poe's shenanigans. They include starting food fights, excessive drinking, and showing up to formation wearing nothing except boots and a cartridge belt. After being discharged for numerous and obvious reasons, Poe became an editor at the Southern Literary Messenger in Richmond by 1835. There he became known as the Tomahawk Man and the Comanche of Literature for his slashing reviews and starting very public feuds with other writers. Nonetheless, by 1834, Poe had become an accomplished writer and fully developed his powers. That year, Poe developed his most famous story, The Telltale Heart. It is only five pages long. And despite his growing skill, Poe remained at the mercy of publishers like The Pioneer, an ambitious literary magazine. The editor fought Poe on publishing The Telltale Heart, judging it too loud for the public, whatever that meant. While Poe had his story published, he received very little money for it. Indeed, the most money Poe would ever receive for a story would be $15 for his iconic poem, The Raven. Yet we are fortunate that Poe published The Telltale Heart. It is a murder story unlike almost any other. We do not know the narrator's age, name, where the story takes place, or even his relationship to the old man. For that matter, we do not know if the narrator is a man or a woman. Poe's views on women were somewhat contradictory. On the one hand, he believed women should be treated with respect and had been appalled by the way his foster father treated his foster mother during her final days. Yet, on the other hand, most people believed in Poe's time that women tended to be more emotional than men and more prone to outbursts and meltdowns, and it is a near certainty that Poe shared at least some of the prejudices of his time. Whether man or woman, the narrator lives with an old man. Possibly their father, possibly not. Given Poe's unhappy relationship with his foster father, it would not be surprising if the narrator and old man were father and son. Of course, in an age of high mortality rates, they could be adopted relations or step relations. The story opens with one word, true. Effectively, this is a confession to a crime. 
However, it is unclear to whom the narrator speaks. Could it be a judge, a prison warden, a doctor, or perhaps a newspaper reporter? Early on, the narrator writes, Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. Yet the narrator has become obsessed with the old man's blind eye, which he calls a vulture eye. Despite preparing to commit murder for such a small reason, the narrator says, Why would you say I am mad? Hearken, listen, and observe, and listen how healthily and calmly I can tell you the story. By having the narrator speak in short staccato sentences, Poe shows the narrator's disturbed mind. The narrator goes on to describe how he showed ever greater kindness to the old man, yet each night he sticks his head into the old man's bedroom door with absurd slowness and shines a light from a lantern upon the dreaded eye. For seven nights the eye is closed and the narrator judges that he must not commit the murder. Again, insisting upon his or her sanity, the narrator declares, Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as to do this? It is important that the narrator is obsessed with the old man's eye, for ancient superstition centered on the supposed powers of an evil eye. On the eighth night, the old man finally awakens when the narrator enters his room. For an hour, the narrator stands frozen, but hears the ever louder hammering of the old man's heart. Certain that a neighbor will hear, the narrator then opens the lantern and the light falls upon the old man's blind eye. The narrator then lunges at the old man, hurls him to the floor, and pulls the bed over him. Soon after, the old man dies, most likely a heart attack caused by severe fright and the blow of the bed upon his chest. In another sign of the narrator's deranged mind, instead of simply leaving the old man in bed and then claiming to have found him dead the next morning, the narrator takes him to a tub, dismembers him, and buries the bits and pieces of him in the floorboards. The narrator insists that this is a perfect plan and cites it as further proof of his perfectly sound mind. Of course, the neighbors hear the old man scream and constables come to investigate an hour after the murder. Supremely confident, the narrator tells them to search well. The constables do just that, and the narrator tells them that he himself screamed in a dream and that the old man went to the countryside for his health. With the constable seemingly duped, the narrator invites them to sit in the very room where the old man's remains are buried under the floorboards. What follows is one of the most famous moments in literature. At the height of his triumph, the narrator hears a ringing in his ears, which turns out to be the beating of the old man's heart, at least so he thinks. As he once obsessed over the old man's eye, the narrator is now obsessed with the heart. In a frenzy of alarm and certain the two constables hear it, yet pretend to hear nothing to torment him, the narrator breaks down and confesses to the crime. Could the narrator have suffered a supernatural punishment or plunged ever deeper into madness? Eight years later, the U.S. government changed the legal definition of insanity to allow the insanity plea to be used in murder cases. This reform included the creation of the idea of moral insanity, which Poe likely used in his story. Indeed, the narrator's habit of hearing things that might not be there, constant moodiness and paranoia, and unprovoked violence has led some to believe the narrator might be clinically insane. Then again, he might have suffered a supernatural visitation. Then again, he might be a she. We don't know for certain, and that's what gives the telltale heart the power to terrify readers through the centuries. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.